Hi, Kathy. Sorry I couldn't get in here sooner. I should have left a little more buffer room in between the breakout sessions. And hello, Kevin. Thank you so much for being here. Absolutely. And you're doing a wonderful job. No worries. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I'll be here to help kind of just mute people as needed. I can look after the chat box. Um, if you need breakout rooms, let me know. Any Anything that you need, I'm here to help support with. Sounds good. Kevin, you're gonna let this slide? Up to you, you tell me. I'll let you do it, I'm not for the pad. You've done it in the past. I have, you're right. So Stacy, you just let me know when it's a good idea to share if you wanna do kind of the housekeeping stuff first and then I'll share after that. Okay, yeah, sounds good. We have people a couple more minutes to trickle in. We've been seeing roughly about 50 participants per session. So I imagine that we'll get a few more as we get closer to that start time. And then Kathy, when I share, I'm not able to see the slide notes because I only have one screen. So if I missed something that I'm supposed to say, you can always chime in. Folks wouldn't mind just trying to follow those same naming conventions from this morning with your um, college acronym in the front. When I get the attendance records, it just comes as one big spreadsheet and it's sorted by the, the first letter of whatever is in your name. So if you could help us with sorting by renaming with your college acronym at the front, that will help us to sort um, at the end of, of today's sessions. I told Kevin he probably wasn't going to get credit for this so much. I know. I see. He was great because I saw that he had renamed himself in the in the first meeting too, and I was like, "Oh, there's Kevin," because <laughs> he was a standalone. Well, I didn't want you to have to search thirteen rosters and directories for the name Kevin Kelly, wondering who that guy is. <laughs> I very much appreciate that. It does help. It does help greatly. There's there's just limitations with tracking attendance in Zoom meetings. Um, yeah. And when you've got folks from 15 different institutions, 16 if you count CCC online separately, because uh, we've got Ames and CMC folks with us. So it's a it's a lot, there's a lot of folks. It's good. I'm so glad to see good, um, strong participation from across the system, across the state. All right, well, um, I would like to say thank you again very much to Kathy and Kevin for lending their time um, to us today to present. And um, Kevin is joining us from San Francisco, San Francisco State, is that correct? That is correct. Wonderful, and then we've got Kathy from Colorado Community, Colorado Community Colleges Online uh, to talk to us today about incorporating welcoming and inclusive teaching practices in your online course. I'm gonna hand it over to you two. 
All right, Kevin's going to give us screen share here. Yes. Kathy, there does seem to be a little bit of muffling with your, your vocals. Does that help? Slightly. Here we go. So welcome everybody. Um, our session today, incorporating welcoming and inclusive teaching uh, practices in your online course um, comes from some work that Kathy and I did over the last uh, six to eight months. And so um, we're gonna tell you a little bit about what we did and then engage you in some of the activities that we ran for that process. So let's get going. All right, uh, is my audio better now? Stacy? I changed mics. Much better, yes, you're loud and clear now. I had the wrong mic on. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> All right, well, what happened, I'll start off. Um, Colorado Community Colleges Online developed and hosted a welcoming and inclusive teaching institute that we ran during the fall, and Kevin will describe that a little bit more. Kevin and I spent most of the summer designing the institute, and we spent um, a good deal of time working on it, and then we ran it for five sessions in the fall. It was open to all of the colleges, and we had participants from pretty much every institution. And so what we're going to do today is to show you a little bit, give you a little taste of what that institute was like. So the institute, as Kathy mentioned, had five sessions, and we um, broke it up uh, looking at what it means to make your course welcoming and inclusive from five different perspectives. The, the online course environment and outcomes in that reimagining online learning, facilitating and managing engagement, designing the course environments themselves and of course content to be welcoming and inclusive, um, assessing learning and, and then last but not least, one of our most popular sessions was how do we can make connections for our students to find and seek out support as they go through our courses. So we had um, not only Kathy and myself go through uh, these activities, but um, quite a few instructors, uh, and Kathy will tell, tell you how many, as well as some staff from CCC Online, as well as um, some of the campuses. So overall, we had 96 individual people participate in webinars, and we had the sessions divided into, we, we did five webinars, and then associated with those webinars, we did a collab for each webinar. And attendees were allowed to participate in one or either or both of those options. So we had 96 people participate in the webinars. We had five who completed all five of the webinars six who completed four of them, eight who completed three, and then 74 who came to one or two of the sessions. And then for the corresponding collabs or D2L labs, we had 65 total individuals participate and 28 of those completed all five sessions. We had four who completed four of them, six who completed three, and then 26 who did two or fewer. And it should be noted that the webinar numbers on the left uh, are those who joined us live, but some of the people who went through the collabs were able to watch the recordings. Yes, the recordings were all posted into the collab so they could see them. So the structure of each session um, was that we asked people to participate in the live session or watch the recordings so they could learn some different concepts broken up into chunks. Then they would look through the areas that they identified as growth areas, places where they saw opportunities to um, modify their own teaching or their course. Um, they would create a plan. And this is what they did in those collabs in order to earn credit for completing the collab was to basically submit a plan and reply to colleagues with feedback about the plans that they had put and those plans outline what they wanted to implement, one or two things that they had learned about that they wanted to try with their students. And then they had the discussions with rich feedback in the uh, D2L space for the, for the collabs. 
So what we're going to do for this little workshop, which is five workshops condensed into 50 minutes, we're going to give you a sample of each of, of three of the different workshops, and we're going to share the outcomes and the activities for those. So the first one, it, the outcome that we're going to share is making course activities more accessible and inclusive for students with disabilities. And what we'd like you to do, and this is what we did in our workshop, was I'm going to post, let me find the chat here, the URL to this Padlet in the chat. And what we'd like you to do is to go to the Padlet, and there are a couple of questions on there for you to answer. To answer. And Kevin is sharing the Padlet so you can see it. We'd like you to answer these two questions. Identify accessibility challenges that you see in engagement and then share how to address these accessibility challenges or how you address them. And there's two columns for each, so you have room to write. And if you haven't used Padlet before, just click a little plus sign in the column that you want to add your thoughts. Um, and it could be challenges that you've noticed in your own classes or students have expressed or different strategies that you've employed in your classes to support students. And again, the context for these challenges is when we engage our students in different activities or conversations. We've got some great ones coming in there. I'm gonna add one. Great, so we're seeing lots of challenges. And I'm wondering if anybody has any strategies that they've used in their courses to address those challenges, especially again, in the context of helping students to interact with one another. I know in my class, I use um, Flipgrid, which allows students to have video-based conversations that are asynchronous but Flipgrid automatically captions the videos and I make sure students have the tutorial for how to edit those captions if they're not accurate. And I see some great strategies making videos of how to navigate the course using text to speech tools and letting students know where they can find those. They're often free. Read speaker built into D2L or integrated is a better way to put it. Short videos to help downloading, right? So they don't have big files. Um, just a comment on Read Speaker. I believe that starting in the fall, all of the systems will have Read Speaker available. Fantastic. All right, we'll keep those ideas coming. And shall I jump back to the slides, Kathy? Yes, let's. So there were some great ideas there. Um, what we're going to do, what I'm going to do next is just cover a few that we've, Kevin and I came up with as we were preparing for this workshop that we did. Um, one is the simultaneous, not use simultaneous media channels, if you're visually impaired, you want to have, I'm sorry, my brain just went on vacation. <laughs> Visual impairment, learning, learning disabilities, audio from speaker and audio from screen reader. If you have both happening at the same time, that's overload for students. And that happens quite a bit. If you're using video and talking over it, it can get very confusing. If you're hearing impaired, sometimes you can have reading captions while you speak from the speaker and reading the chat can be a visual overload or an audio overload. And as most of you commented on, inaccessible media is used in your engagement. You have lack of captions, you have lack of alternative text and things like that. 
All right, Kevin, you can go now. So here's some accessibility strategies before you do your engagement. In, order, in other words, prepping for it. Um, use, check your accessibility of content before you start. Office and Adobe both have accessibility checkers built into them. You can check with those. Review the captioning of transcripts of audios and videos and remediate any that are incorrect. It's nothing worse than watching a, a video and having the key point be missing because the transcript or the captioning is inaccurate. And provide multiple ways for engagement. Have audio, have text. If you have images, make sure you have alt text. And one other thing I have is provide descriptive text for videos or visuals that can convey content that is not described in the transcript or in the captioning. Some other strategies you can use. Go to the next slide, please, Kevin. Thank you. Establish engagement norms that include accessibility. So as you're getting ready to teach your course, make sure you have these set up ahead of time to keep things in line. Ask students anonymously, of course, to share accessibility issues. That way, if, if they're willing, it's obviously up to them to do that. If they're willing to share any accessibility issues with you, you can make sure that you're accommodating it before you get to that content. And ask your students to adopt the same accessibility practices you do. If you have them doing video, have them caption them. If you have them doing a trans an, an audio, have them do a transcript. And then the last one we have is provide God guidance for working in breakouts so that when they get there, they know what to do. And if there's someone access who needs an accessibility, you're prepared for that. Right. And I put in the chat that for folks who haven't thought about allowing students to give anonymous feedback, you can use a Google form or other tools to allow students to share um, anonymously. We know that not all students have either the time or know that they can or should seek accommodations through um, disability services. And so we wanna give students opportunities to share things that might otherwise go unnoticed or unknown by the instructor. Excellent point, Kevin. All right, and then we're gonna move on talking about some forum and discussions. As you monitor and facilitate your forum discussions, if you're in an online setting, you, keep your, you need to keep the students on topic. So monitor and make sure that they're not getting off topic as you're having your discussions. As part of your assignments, ask students to create unique tiles for their threads. So instead of saying response to discussion one, say information on whatever your topic may be. Um, response to just doesn't help students. And then ask students to discuss topics from different perspectives instead of just from the student perspective. You can assign them roles or ask them to choose a role if you want. And Kevin's got a great, we've got a great picture here of types of discussions you can use. Right, in my own class, um, before I switched over to asking students to use five or six words to summarize their thread or their reply to a thread, you can see on the left-hand side, synthesis discussion, synthesis discussion, discussion. So imagine having a screen reader just read those titles to you and not being able to tell which one is which, which one would I click and, and open up and reply to. But you can see on the right, reminders to keep me on track. Wolfram Alpha is the way to exit math class, learning about rocks with purple X. All those are very clear and students can jump right in and they know what they're, what they're getting into when they click the link. We also see a question from Linda Hertz about cognitive disabilities, anxiety, brain impairment from let's say PTSD or traumatic brain injury, uh, which might be uh, a wartime issue, but can also happen in things like car accidents or, or other issues. Linda, 
I don't profess to be an expert, but I do know that there are a number of strategies that we can use to support students with those disabilities. Things like uh, right now we're talking about engagement. So providing multiple pathways for them to participate so that they aren't forced to do something, let's say um, in real time, if they would prefer to have more time to work out their response to something, um, allowing them to use the chat instead of hopping on camera and having to come up with an answer right away. Um, different strategies for anxiety also include proactive um, activities where you make sure students have access to any mental health support. Um, and you might even put it right in your instructions for an assignment. Let's say it's a big one. You can say, hey, if this um, assignment is causing you stress, um, don't forget that you have these links to get support. Um, and that support could be talking to someone from psych and counseling services, or it could be letting them know about apps like Calm or Headspace that are designed for mindfulness, breathing, um, ways to reduce anxiety. And there's actually one out of the Department of Defense, I believe called um, self, -man self Management of Anxiety or SAM. Uh, self Assessment of Anxiety Management, something like that. Uh, so there are lots of tools out there and I'll leave it to Kathy to add any that she knows about or strategies um, to help students with cognitive disabilities. I think you covered everything I know, so. Sure. And then if we were talking about assessment and other things, then we might think about, um, you know, making it only one question on a page for our quizzes so that students who have attention deficit hyperactive disorder um, might not be um, having a hard time focusing on which question they're answering at one time. If you have 10 questions on a page, sometimes the answer responses from one thing are sitting above the question for the next question and they might start uh, jumping between the two. So there are plenty of strategies out there and we'll definitely encourage you to work with your accessibility unit on your campus to identify ways to support those students as well. All right. So the next thing we talk about is accessibility strategies for engagement in video conference, something we've all become quite familiar with in the last couple of years. The first one is provide multiple ways for your students to ask questions. They can raise their hands. They can turn their mics on and talk. Um, other, if you have other ones, we'd be glad to hear them. Other things you can do, make sure everyone is muted when you're not when they're not speaking. Um, I don't mind hearing a dog bark in the background for a minute, but too long and it can get a little annoying, even if it's my own dog. And the other thing that we don't have that we've added just recently is both Zoom and WebEx, whichever one you're using, now have the ability to turn cap tra transcript captioning on live. So if you have a student who needs that, you can turn that on. And I recommend turning it on so that they have the option to turn that on at any time if they, so that they have it if they need it. Mm -hmm. And if you're using Zoom and a student is accompanied by an American Sign Language interpreter, then you can spotlight that interpreter so that the student doesn't have to search for the person in the participants. Um, it'll basically pop up with you, the instructor, as someone that is always visible. All right, your turn. Great, well, so, that was, again, one topic from one of the five sessions. So you can see how rich the Institute was. Um, each of the sessions that we did live lasted around 90 minutes. And so we went through activities first to identify what people know about something, what they believe about something, how they feel about something um, before jumping in and sharing some strategies that we've gleaned from the research, from our own practices, and from some other thought leaders in, in the area. So 
for this next topic, directing students to academic and non-academic support, we drew on the rich resources within the Colorado Community College system. And we pulled it together a panel of people who work in academic support services, accessibility and accommodation, non-academic support services, um, even areas like health and wellness to address the topics like Linda Hertz just brought up, but not on the academic side, and then technology. So you can imagine uh, how rich that conversation was. And so what we are going to do with you is pull together some questions that we asked the panel, and we want to find out what you already know about something, what you want to know about something, and then we'll share some of the things that the panel shared with us. Does this sound like a good plan? All right, I'm going to assume yes. <laughs> All right, so we have another activity for you, and Kathy has put it in the chat. I will click the link just like you all so that we are there together. And just like before, we'd love for you to hop in there and share what support challenges that you and your students face in your online courses and what support services that you currently recommend to your students in any of those five categories that we discussed. And already we're seeing English as a second language challenge. Seeing more people pop in the Padlet. If students miss classes, how do they get back on track? Right, because they might have a job, they might be taking care of children or adults who need caregiver support. Childcare, there you go, another. Writing skills probably goes with the English, English as a second language, but sometimes not, right? Technology problems using other technologies like computers and calculators, financial monetary challenges, reliable Wi-Fi, right? If a student gets sick or long-term illness. Alicia put in the chat, writing. Internet access, so we have quite a few challenges what support services are you all sharing to your with your students? I see student success, accommodation or disability services, writing labs, including Purdue's OWL, which I believe stands for Online Writing Lab, if I'm not mistaken. Student Support Center for Food and Therapy. Yes, food and housing insecurity are big challenges for students all around the country, and Colorado's no exception. And the challenges is an interesting one, commitment and self-discipline for an online course. And as Kathy hinted that over the last couple of years, we've been doing more of this online stuff thanks to the pandemic. Um, some students were taking online classes that they may not have wanted to take online. And so that um, commitment and self-discipline can be a real challenge for students who want to reach their academic goals, but are faced with um, maybe motivation issues or just not sure how to go about um, tackling the course activities. If it's a first generation student, that might be an additional hurdle on top of just coming to terms with what being a college student is like. And so you can see some of the ideas you're putting in the, the other two columns about free services, counseling, librarians, and more are all Great. So I'm going to hop back here so that we can dive into some of the things that we asked the panelists. And um, again, we hope that you'll help us answer these. And we started by asking how and when should faculty reach out to support staff on their campus? And we asked that mainly because we know that Support staff are, are busy folks too. And so let's say that you would love for um, a tutor to talk to your class, um, giving them more than one day's notice or same day notice that, hey, can you pop into my class and, and talk about how it's structured, how they access your services. So um, 
I see there Eric Thompson has before classes start. What are other people think? Early and often. Yes, How do you find out, find the tutors, the academic tutors? So each campus has a different um, options. So you'll want to check with uh, maybe starting with your campus website and then working from there. Also, you might be able to go to the student services, um, the VP of student services or someone in their office to identify what tutoring is uh, available to the students. Um, Kathy, since you're in the system, what would you advise to an instructor who wants to know how to direct their students to tutoring? Uh, I would say pretty much what you just said. I would start, maybe your department chair will know. For sure, the vice president of academic affairs should know. And your support services should also know. You should have a support services staff. Roxy says incorporate some into classes invite support staff to class or provide types of resources. Mm -hmm. and Definitely. So we, we heard from the panelists that, um, that they are often invited to give a presentation or record a presentation if they can't be at your class time, especially for night classes or um, if it's conflicting with some other engagement, but they might be able to record a little five minute presentation that you can play for your students or put in your D2L course um, and maybe even link to it from your syllabus and from the different uh, assignments. I'm a big fan of not only putting information in the syllabus, but also making it a just in time resource for students as they complete each activity or assignment, they know where to go. So Roger says it would be great if there were pre-recorded message from tutors and the accessibility units. So that might be something to check in with, uh, since you're at CCC online, um, check in with your central office and see how that might be possible to get. While you keep those ideas coming, I'm gonna hop to the next question that we asked our panel. And that was, because the whole focus of this uh, institute was to create more welcoming and inclusive courses, how can faculty help students see working with academic or non-academic services staff as a welcoming and ex inclusive experience? So I'm curious to think, see what you all think. And Joan has support services in their class. They have a discussion with each individual student. I like that idea that normalizes it. Mm -hmm. And that was a big uh, term that we heard from, um, I believe it was Will uh, on our panel, um, who talked about the importance of normalizing this experience so that students don't uh, feel a stigma of reaching out for support. And in some cases, the instructors um, will build it into an assignment, maybe the first assignment of the semester, something that's lower stakes. Um, as part of the assignment, reach out to a librarian faculty to help you identify three sources that match the topic that you're going to um, write your, your research paper about. Or um, go ask a question from uh, a tutor about one of the homework problems from problem set one in physics, um, even if you don't need it, so that you, know, you figure out how to get there and know who you can talk to. But it was important in that conversation with the panel um, that everyone know that it's okay and actually a, a good idea, not just for some students, but for all students to take advantage of the different resources that are available, whether they be um, asynchronous resources that students can download and check out. I know, um, I don't know if it's CC Denver or Aurora that has a great 
almost 200 page packet for parents who are students and identifying help that they can get. Um, but in this case, we're encouraging you to think about ways that you can normalize the process of going to seek help. And something that I learned from the California Community College System students, they have a student senate that put together a panel to talk to teachers about what students need. They were very clear that the students who need the help the most are the ones who are least likely to go out and find it. They are not as strong for self-advocacy. And so we need to make it real easy. We need to light up the runway and tell them that it's okay. In the spirit of time, maybe we'll jump to this one here. What help can students get after hours if they must complete coursework or assignments after work or after their childcare obligations? We saw those come up in the Padlet as challenges that students face. And um, again, it's something that you'll want to identify on your campus, um, which services are offered after hours. So we know that uh, throughout the system, technology help desks um, are 24 seven. You might have a local staff at your college that does technology support during the day, and then they'll flip a switch that at night and on weekends, students can continue to get technology support. While other campuses will use that 24 seven support uh, system the entire day, every day. In other cases for certain topics, um, Tutoring can be 24-7. Uh, and again, that's something that you'll want to check with your campus to see what level of support is available to students. And last, for specific areas of support, um, I know one of the panelists talked about how, um, I think it was CCA, where they have one day a week that services like financial aid and a couple of others are available till 6 or 7 p.m. So they have some after hours support for students who need it maybe once or twice a week. So in order to support your students, it's useful that you know when those things are available and to advocate for some type of after hours support uh, so that those students who need help when everybody's gone for the day uh, can get it. All right, so the next question we asked our panelists is how can faculty and student services staff make courses welcoming and inclusive experience for students with disabilities? And overwhelmingly, they said, make sure that the content is accessible, which we have talked about before. And one of the reasons for that is if it's not accessible and the disability support staff has to help remediate it, they're Honestly, our staff at every campus right now is overwhelmed. And so they're having a hard time getting to all the help they need to give. So the more we can give as faculty and instructors by having it ready, the better off we are. Okay, I just like Kevin's going to the next slide, so. Not quite sure what happened there. Let's go back to that slide so you can finish what you were saying. I think I finished what I was saying. <laughs> All right. And then the next one is preparing faculty. What academic or no, non-academic support services may faculty not know about? I believe mostly what our panelists said is they have most of the campuses have some support for mental health. At the very least, they can refer their students to mental health. If you go to the student services support, they also have support, as we were talking about, for food issues and financial issues. But if you go to those support services, they can at least direct their students to where they need to go to get help. Right. And even for things like food security, if the student can't come to campus, for a local food bank, then they might be able to point the student to one closer to their home with, um, there are different websites that make it easy to find uh, pantries and uh, different places that you can get food through community organizations. Um, so we wanna make sure we're supporting students where they are. 
Right. And then the last activity, which Kevin will get to, was to reassign, redesign assessments to manage equity based challenges. And once we did, again did a little padlet for our participants, so we're going to have you do the same. Great. And I will click the same link. Did it not go there? It might be that it doesn't have the HTTP it might, there. It might be. It's probably what it is. There we go. So now it's there. And for the last topic, Roxy talks about 211 as being a good resource for most communities. Thanks for sharing that. So I'm gonna to hop to our third activity. And again, this, um, so we've covered engagement with our students. We've covered helping students find and uh, work with different support services. And this last one is about assessment in online environments. And so we're curious to know the different strategies you use to assess student learning and what challenges arise when you're assessing learning online. Exams, quizzes, discussions, exams. Factoring is an accessibility challenge, definitely. And in some cases, it can be an equity challenge as well. online discussion boards, interactive listening, games sponsored by the textbook publishers, papers, rubrics. So we're seeing quite a variety uh, of activities that you use to assess learning, including tools that go beyond D2L, like voice thread for discussions or those textbook publisher listening games. Be interested to know if that listening game is for language or music or something like that. Activities built using soft chalk where you can build in assessment. And I know other tools like Play Posit um, allow you to add comprehension questions to little videos that you create. So if you're creating mini lectures for students to consume, they can be prompted to answer a question right in the video. I believe you just allows that capability too. That's what we use here. Mm -hmm. the listening games are for music. All right. Language barriers are, uh, exist. Students don't always seem to follow instructions. And I know some instructors have taken to creating little overview videos just a one minute video to walk students through their assignment in case they're not reading the instructions completely or don't understand them. Time constraints, Roger says, especially if they start an activity close to the deadline, that could be a, a challenge. Turn it in, which is a plagiarism detection service. So lots of challenges you've identified. So let's take a look at um, what we've put together, see where we overlap and how we can learn from each other. All right, so some common assessment methods and the equity challenges that stem from them, you can see uh, we didn't come up with anything new. You all put it in uh, the Padlet that you use quizzes and exams, labs, um, which some people characterize as uh, practicums or practicals, um, presentations, discussions, essays, projects, and more. Um, the equity challenges can relate to technology access or internet access. Students may not have a device, so they may be performing some of these assessment tasks on a smartphone or without a really good internet connection. Um, they may not be familiar with some assessment methods like soft chalk or uh, listening games. And so if there's no tutorial on how to complete an activity, um, they may 
may run into some challenges. Um, definitely, there may be bias in different, um, let's say, publisher creative materials that if they have a set of questions that go with a textbook chapter, are they written in a very Eurocentric way so that students who are international students um, may not understand the context or how something's framed? Um, are you providing enough assessment opportunities? Um, we, I just heard earlier today uh, with Dr. J. Luke Wood talked about um, courses that have maybe a midterm and a final exam as the only ways to assess student learning. And that puts a lot of stress on students um, and, and forces them to do well on a small number of activities instead of creating more opportunities for them to show what they know and maybe different types of opportunities where you're combining things like uh, discussions with exams, with essays, so that if they're not good at one, they can still demonstrate their ability to show what they know through some other channel. Also, designing a welcoming and inclusive assessment process um, following just what I was talking about, providing multiple ways for them to show what they know. That might include low stakes and no stakes opportunities to practice like practice quizzes or having them go through some self-assessment surveys, um, maybe having them do a reflection on whether or not they feel ready for an exam or what's called an exam wrapper, which asks them to think about what they did to prepare for the last exam so they can change their behaviors and be more ready for the next exam uh, based on how well they did. Clarifying your expectations, sharing rubrics, checklists, and examples of what the work should look like. Those examples could come from previous semesters where you've gotten permission to share a particular student's work, or you can um, basically mock up a, a student uh, work on your own. Uh, I've done that before. And sometimes it's interesting for me to go back and, and complete my own activities and assignments. Also, welcoming and inclusive assessment processes mean that you're providing timely targeted feedback, um, which might be done via text using a rubric as some of you identified in the Padlet. And some might be using video. I know it's becoming more common to create a screencast about uh, students' um, science or math related problems um, where you can give them feedback about each one and where they may have missed a step in a particular equation. Or it could be for an essay where you basically scroll through their essay and write up uh, or speak uh, to the transitions they're making between ideas or the amount of support they're providing to support their argument. When we help students prepare for assessment, uh, again, it's, it could be that we have those practice quizzes, but have we gone one further step and put what's called the, the uh, automated feedback? So if you haven't taken a look at your quiz, tool lately, you can, for each question, you can say, if you get this right, you get a little sentence or two that tells you um, more information. And that doesn't have to be the answer to the question. It can be, hey, if you missed this question, go check out page 25 of the book. Go check out this link where um, you'll find the information you need to get this question right next time. Also, having students assess themselves um, again, using different tools like surveys or maybe study groups, and then having review sessions. Uh, I created something called the virtual um, work uh, sprints where students would come and just log into Zoom with me for half hour chunks, and they would set aside 25 minutes to reach a specific goal that they set for themselves at the beginning. And then they would um, report back how well they did, or they would ask questions of everybody in the room if they ran into problems during that period. So having a review session creates a sense of community, but also helps students um, get used to dedicating specific time 
on different days, not just the day of the exam, right before the exam, spacing out their study. So when we're talking about clarifying what our expectations are for students, when we give them something that's going to assess their learning, uh, there are three different S's that we can follow, streamline those expectations. How many of you like um, in book chapters these days, it's called TL semicolon DR, too long semicolon didn't read. So if you have a lot of instructions for your students, create a bullet list that summarizes them first uh, so that they can um, get the gist and then dive into the full instructions for all the details. Um, but sometimes giving them that high level view before they dive into the details will help them make sense of our instructions. And again, I've pointed it out before, in my own uh, instructions, I like to include a need help or a just-in-time help section that has links to the relevant support for that particular activity, whether that be the library, the tutoring center, a mental health support, or whatever it might be. And Aunt Dr. Montoya says that she gives visual feedback for public speaking, one or two bite-sized feedback items to focus on before their next speech. Nice. That's a great idea. Especially since it's a vis uh, public speaking, giving visual feedback and audio feedback is great. Mm -hmm. And there is some literature, and it's only one or two articles, so I'm not going to say it's definitive, but the, uh, those two studies showed that students adopted the feedback that the instructors gave from video-based feedback um, more frequently than the written feedback. And I don't know if that's because the students in those studies preferred video to text, but it's an interesting thing to try out with your own students. So uh, earlier I mentioned something called exam wrappers, and if you haven't done that before, it's basically a reflection activity that helps students determine what did and didn't work with respect to getting ready for an exam or a big, big activity. And so you can ask them to answer, hey, how did you prepare? What can you take away from the errors that you made or the feedback that I gave you? And what would you do differently to prepare next time? So those, and there's plenty of literature around exam wrappers. Um, basically helping students learn how to learn. And I know um, that metacognition or the idea of learning how to learn is something that we don't often help our students understand. And so we can do it through activities like this. So we wanted to save some time um, for you all to ask questions or share ideas of what you're doing. If anyone in the room actually went through the Institute. If you have any things that you wanna share that you gained from it or that you um, still wanna know after going through it. Um, but this time is for you to think about how we can make our courses more welcoming and inclusive. We've gone through three different activities that help you start thinking about it, but uh, there's plenty more to it. So I'll put myself on mute and see what you all have to say or type. For those watching the recording, Kristen says, I do this as a reflection mid-class on their progress, areas where they feel they're doing well and where they feel they struggle, and what resources I gave that they feel they could benefit from using. So that sounds like a great idea, a mid-class reflection activity. Feel free to raise your hand if you prefer to speak, then type. Alicia likes the idea to create assignments for students to reach out to staff. And Dr. Montoya has her hand up. Yeah, it's just easier for me to speak on it. Um, another thing I do in my online class is, it, I don't, I do like yourself, Kevin, I have, I don't always put all the resources in the syllabus. Like I have a section labeled for resources specifically. 
And then that has subsections in it because they're more likely to go to that. But with those bite-sized feedbacks that I was talking about with the video feedback, I make sure to grade within a week time frame. That way it gives them more action, like it gives them more time to integrate it into, into their next assignment. So that's my rule is I have to give a week turnaround from the submission of that assignment so they can actually put it into work. That's great. And I know for people who have large classes, my classes sometimes have 50 to 100 students. So that might mean that uh, I don't want to water down the class. So I still have plenty of writing assignments, but I might have a, a peer review feedback. So they get feedback from their colleagues or classmates um, first, and then they can make revisions um, based on that before they turn it into me. Roxy says she's trying to make the tone of the syllabus, less about the rules and more about how students can succeed. Yes, and there uh, is some great stuff out there from Michelle Pekansky Brock, and I'll put it in the chat called the liquid syllabus. If you put this in your browser and search, um, you'll get some great ideas about how you can keep that idea going. Lisa says, Curious to know if faculty require a minimum number of posts for a score in discussions. So before I answer, I will see what other people think. What are your practices when you have discussions with your students? Well, I'm gonna answer that. Do I was from the con conference I just came back from yesterday. There was, there's a company called Yellow Dig where their philosophy is not to use discussions weekly, but they have a, a streaming app that they use where it's more like a, a, an ongoing conversation throughout the, the course. And it looked like it'll work, it'll, it would work really well and it would eliminate the need for numbers of posts for scores. And one, one post, two responses type thing. Hmm. Um, and I'll put the title for that in here as well as if anyone's interested in looking at it. Um, right. Grace and I were both fascinated by it. It's, I think it's a little bit like Slack. and um, A little bit like Slack. It's, it, it, it looks more like um, a Facebook type feed. Mm -hmm. and Joan says uh, she uses voice thread and students make their own voice threads. So more rigor. Uh, and the students can reply to each other using text or voice um, to get to um, Mark Whittier's comment about the reflection after each chapter or unit. Um, that could also be done technologically if you use a tool like Hypothesis or eMargin, which is what's called a social reading tool or collaborative annotation tool where you assign a particular chapter and students can highlight different sections and see what other students are highlighting. Um, they can ask questions or respond to questions that you put in there in advance as prompts. Um, so there are lots of ways that we can um, use technology to create more uh, support, but also richer uh, experiences with different aspects of the teaching and learning process. Roxy says, Usually she requires initial post and two replies. It does depend on the topic. Some reflection discussions, but those don't require replies, but students reply anyway. Typically I break mine up so that they know that they're gonna get 10 points for their original post and five points for each reply. And they can earn up to 25 points for the activity. So it's up to them how many replies they wanna put. Um, but I think it's, equally important that we give students better prompts for the replies. Often we'll have a paragraph or more describing what we want in their original post, and then we'll just tack on and please reply to two other students. But that doesn't give them very much to go on, right? Especially those first generation students who aren't used to online discussions or um, students who just are not familiar with the topic and aren't quite sure how to give critical feedback to their students. So in some cases, I'll give my students a cheat sheet of 
probing questions that they can ask their, their classmates to better understand what they've written. Or I'll give them a, a challenge. Find one person who has posted something similar to yours and one person who's posted something very different from yours. And I'll give them a task, uh, either ask questions to understand more or provide a resource that they may not know about to help them further their thinking. Um, but by providing better prompts for the replies and discussions, I think we do our students a better service and helping them succeed in the overall goal of creating a learning community and learning with and, um, and among each other. Chelsea likes giving students three different discussion questions to pick from and they just rep reply to one. Um, and that is brilliant. And that follows the universal design for learning principle to provide an element of choice for students to demonstrate what they know, because then they can pick something where they feel their strongest, but all three questions all align with one of the course learning outcomes or one of that week's module or weekly learning outcomes. Great idea, Chelsea. Well, we're down to about three minutes here. So any last questions you'd be glad to answer. Mm -hmm. right. And we'll have to leave it off so that we can get to our next sessions. Right. And Stacy, anytime you need to step in to let people know how and where to go next. Yes. So um, at the end of the day, there are some breakout sessions for each of the colleges. There are a few colleges who may have made alternate plans and did not provide a breakout session. Um, the breakout sessions are intended for college cohorts to get come together to talk about what they might have learned, what they'd like to implement, um, what their takeaways are for the day, um, and how to move forward with what they've picked up. So I hope that you all took lots away from this present presentation, as well as the other presentations that you attended throughout the day, um, and, and have some ideas about how you will continue to implement this work in your own spaces. Um, I thank you all so, so very much for utilizing this day for taking this day and making the most of it for being here and participating. Um, I've been working on the video uploads and edits while listening to this presentation. So all of those will be available um, hopefully early next week. And um, I will be communicating on that as well, but um, I'll release you to go to your college breakout sessions. Um, thank you so much for being here and I'll see you all soon. Great. Thanks, Kathy. Yeah, I'll we'll see you at the Peralta one in a couple of weeks. A couple of weeks, yeah. And Stacy, thank you again. I know how much work goes behind these. I'm organizing a conference that's three days long and it's uh, it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. There's just so many, I think we're, it, 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 there's so many details to remember. Like, do I, do I have this in place? Are there enough people to, to, to spread across? Do we have the communications in place? And my communications were very delayed because I also had another, a large in-person event on Wednesday this oh, week. Gosh. Um, and just got back from vacation. And I was out for two weeks and yeah. <laughs> so, well, hopefully you're all rested up. Um, no, I am <laughs> trash tired right now. It was not a restful vacation at all. So um, oh, thanks again, Stacy. Yeah. So, but yeah, thank you so much for, for your work today. And um, I'll talk to you both soon. Sure. And I'll put in the chat if you're interested. It's a conference about equity as well. So maybe others in the Colorado system will want to know about it. But yeah, um, absolutely. it'll be in just about a week and a half. It's free, virtual, it will all be recorded. And uh, Kathy will be one of the speakers. Yeah, we'll be doing what we just did. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. All right. Well, I will. Um, I'll be sure to, to share that out across the team. Excellent. Thanks again, Stacy. Thank you, Bye, Kevin. Thank See you in a couple Kevin. weeks. Bye. Bye. -bye.